virtual meeting of the Board of Commissioners of the Greater Boca Raton Park District is now called to order. It is Monday, October 19th, 2020. It is now 5.16 p.m. Joanne, would you please call the roll? Sure. Commissioner Ertz? Here. Commissioner Engel? Here. Commissioner Rollins? Here. Commissioner Volkelsang? Here. And Commissioner Wright? Here. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Uh, commissioners, are there any changes to the agenda? Hearing none, it's time for public requests. Uh, Brianne, would you read the ones that have come in first and then we'll call upon the public. Yes, I will. We have one um, from Regina Eklund, 5201 Northwest 2nd Avenue. The day Mayor Singer announced the Bokit Country Club deal, I sent an email to all Beach and Park District Commissioners and City Council expressing my shock and dissatisfaction with the city's decision. The loss of getting an 18-hole course in the Boca Tica community after years of promises by Mayor Singer and being told to just be patient is an unbelievable betrayal. While it provides an 18-hole championship course, tennis courts, and a fancy clubhouse, Boca Country Club is not a good facility for beginner and recreational golfers and those who prefer to walk the course rather than ride. I have pointed out the need for an executive course and urged Beach and Parks to proceed with their plans for the east side of the Ocean Breeze property with an executive course, putting course, putting course, excuse me, driving range and learning facility. Some on city council do not understand that Red Reef is not an executive course. Beach and Parks understood the need for creating a golf facility for all ages and abilities. The city has failed to do that in the acquisition of the Boca Country Club. Additionally, I think Beach and Parks would be wise to either hold off on big plans for the west side of Ocean Breeze or create an open passive park that could be converted to the planned 18 hole course in the future. I do not see the Boca Country Club facility succeeding as a well utilized course. And I believe there will be issues with availability of tea times, league play, and fees, as well as much higher maintenance costs than the city is willing to publicly admit. This deal that was conceived behind closed doors, the legality of which needs to be investigated, is not a good deal for golfers, taxpayers, residents of, of the BC community, or residents of the Boca Tica community. We need to demand full disclosure of the details, the contract, and obligations of the VCC deal. City Council has further set up the Beach and Park District to fail in repaying their financial obligation to the city for the west side of the Ocean Breeze property. First, they prevent you from raising the millage rate in 2019. Then they stall and withhold any financial assistance or approval for the construction of the golf course for more than a year. And now they acquire a golf course less than three miles away from the intended Beach and Park District course to kill the project and thereby completely eliminate the district's ability to open a course and generate revenue to pay for the property. While stabbing the Beach and Park District in the back, City Council has done this as a slap in the face to the Boca Tica community. They have chosen to make a deal with a billionaire and bail out a wealth, wealthy community and corporation rather than allow the renovation of the 200 acre golf course that re revitalize a community. I ask that you proceed immediately with the planned golf facilities on the east side of the Ocean Breeze property that you demand that the city relinquish any rights to extend Clintmore Jeffrey through Dixie Highway and that you maintain and protect the west side of the property from the city and from developers. We put our faith and trust in you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I have an additional one that just came in from um, John Mark Jenkins. Greetings to the council and thank you for your service. I will be brief. Please consider moving forward with the golf course west of 2nd Avenue. I think foregoing the bigger expansive idea of including the executive course in the golf academy. Keep it simple, make it great, save money, build a magnificent 18 hole course using all the west side of 2nd Avenue along with a nice clubhouse, snack bar and basic driving range practice putting green. Boca needs one to two courses in the east that can handle the numbers wanting golf and will help with not being able to get tee times or having to always golf with a foursome. The new city course of Boca Country Club should not deter the beach district one bit. The numbers and desire are there. The property values and tax revenues will go up, helping all park areas. Keep it simple, make it great. Thank you, John Mark Jenkins. Okay, if you would call upon uh, the people waiting to speak. Uh, I know Mr. Hurd and Mr. Glanis are waiting. Hey, Mr. Hurd, if you wanna unmute yourself and start talking. No, you were ready. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, you can hear me? Yes, yeah, we can. Address okay, you thank, Greg, please. thank you. Yes, it's Rick Hurd. To... Uh-oh, going in and out. And uh, it's great to see all the commissioners again. Coming through okay? Better now. We lost All my you. comments to Brianne so she can read them if needed. Um, I'm still. Rick, you're going in and out. 
And maybe it's better if you read them since yep. you have them. Okay, Rick, if you want to mute, I'm going to go ahead and read your email. If I'm not coming through clearly, then that's fine. I have it, yeah. Okay, I'm going to read this out loud. Rick Hurd, PGA, U.S. Kids Golf Top 50 Master Kids Teacher, U.S. Kids Certified Instructor, Owner, Partner of Don Law Golf Academy. I wish the city well in its endeavor to reposition the Boca Country Club as the new Boca Raton Municipal Golf Course. I am very familiar with the Boca Country Club and it has its pluses and minuses, but has the potential to serve as an excellent replacement for much, but not all of the existing Boca Municipal. Boca Country Club is a nice golf course, but it has some limitations in the way it's designed around the power lines and through the community. This makes the course less interesting to play and more difficult to navigate for walking and golf course control of things like pace of play. While it is a nice facility, it pales in comparison to what was designed by Price Fazio for the Boca Tica Ocean Breeze property. Frankly, it is not as nice a course as the existing Boca Municipal. The biggest shortcoming of Boca Country Club is the driving range and practice area, which is poorly located relative to the pro shop point of control and is too small to serve the volume of golf traffic to be expected. This area was located and sized for a small private club operation, which worked well, but will be inadequate for municipal play. Furthermore, as you know, the Boca Raton uh, Country Club facility does not include an executive or short course, which has been an important feature of Boca Municipal. Keep in mind that the existing executive course has served more than 25,000 rounds of golf annually. There will continue to be a strong demand for a nine hole short course, not a par three, but a true executive course. Red Reef Golf Course will not be a suitable replacement for the loss of the Boca Municipal executive course. It is too short and is already also serving approximately 25,000 rounds annually. The point of my comments is this, there is still room for for much of what was planned for the Boca Tica property, including a full-scale learning center, driving range, a fun putting course, and a challenging yet playable executive short course. I believe we should revisit the overall plan in light of this development and reconsider where these elements should be located. Factors to keep in mind will be eliminating the need for a tunnel under 2nd Avenue, anticipating the future extension of Jeffrey Street to Dixie Highway, and keeping options open for a championship 18-hole course on the Northwest and Southwest properties in the event the Boca Country Club donation plan falls through. Other factors will include the possibility of adding other recreational elements to the property, such as a field house, walking trails, biking trails, and both active and passive play areas. The bottom line is this. Compared with Boca Municipal, Boca Country Club will be a huge upgrade in clubhouse facilities and includes a pool and nice tennis facility. However, Boca Country Club can act as a replacement for only about two thirds of the current Boca Municipal golf traffic and Boca Country Club's driving range is no larger than the one at Boca Municipal. We must also remember that prior to its closing, Ocean Breeze was an extremely busy golf facility serving 70 to 80,000 rounds per year, far more than the Boca Municipal. This East Boca demand still exists. Boca Country Club will not have the capacity to serve legacy Boca Resort members, relocated Boca Municipal golf golfers and East Boca golf demand. There will still be a need for a quality executive course and championship learning center at Boca Tica. Thank you, Rick. That was uh, the good points. Um, Mr. Galanis. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Okay, uh, good evening, and it's uh, really good to see you guys. I look forward to seeing you in person. Uh, Greg Galana, 1780 Southwest 22nd Ave. And uh, for um, everybody on, I requested extra time as I am the president of Boca Golf Association, and I am representing the interest of over 200 golfers. So it's my intention to get through this stuff quickly, but I've got a lot of information. There's two pieces to what I want to cover. One is um, a, a recent communication that I sent to the mayor and the city council, and I'll read it for you now. Uh, Mr. Mayor and city council, while our golfers are pleased and appreciative that we will be getting Boca Country Club as our new public course, October 1, 2021, we have some concerns. The golfers are very pleased with the prospects of Boca Country Club becoming our new course, but the taxpayers should be concerned about the 25 million the city co-sponsored and loaned beach and parks to acquire the Boca Tica course. The golfers are concerned about potential rate hikes um, for the city residents playing our new course, given the debt service and annual losses that Boca Country Club allegedly carries. Uh, number two, the rift between the city and beach and parks commission must end. Both parties need to come together and do something good for the residents. Boca Tica site has sat idle for way too long and needs some TLC. 
Number three, when the beautiful 27 holes of Boca Municipal will sold, the players who have patronized our beloved course for many years were devastated. Most notably our women's league who play the executive nine and numbers nearly a hundred players. Even with the prospects of both Boca National, the quality executive course was, was in question. Uh, as it is doubtful that the market could support two public championship courses, we would ask that the city take some of the proceeds from the sale of Boca Municipal and invest in a quality nine hole short course and practice area on the east side of 2nd Avenue at Boca Tica. The plans that Price Fazio have prepared for us um, would only need minor modifications and could be a real money maker. Since the inception of the coronavirus, the limited and the limited recreational opportunities, um, golf has grown immensely and showing no signs of slowing down. Most estimates are north of 20% growth year over year. Anybody trying to get a tee time over the last six months know, knows exactly what I'm talking about. And number four, and lastly, uh, preferential tea, tea times, which are being granted to Boca Country Club members, as well as Boca Resort members and guests um, are concerning. The question is, when will residents be able to play? Um, and uh, lastly, was thanking them for the opportunity to weigh in and provide input from the golfing community. So I have an email teed up to send all of you guys which includes um, communication from roughly 20 of my golfers. I'd like to read a handful of them right now. Uh, Carolyn Silla, who is president of the Boca Municipal Women's Nine Holers says, here are some statistics for you to consider when making Red Reef the city's executive course. I run the Thursday morning ladies league on the executive course of Boca Municipal. I have 80 ladies in the membership of the 80, there are 44 who ride and 36 who walk. During the months of January, February, March, there will be between 55 and 65 ladies playing. Using an average of 60 players, there would be 33 riders and 27 walkers. With, with COVID-19 still a concern, most of the ladies would want one golf cart per rider. I can assure you right now that uh, Red Reef does not have 33 carts and they couldn't su even support the, this um, uh, women's league. Um, the next email is from Tom Lambert, who is president of the Boca Muni Men's Golf League. Uh, Tom is also a resident of Boca Tica. We need a golf training center to replace the facility that we will be losing once Boca Municipal Golf Course on Glades Road is closed. A new training center that would include a driving range, professional golf instruction, and an executive type course for the training of new golfers, especially young children, and also for senior golfers who are no longer able to play the regular golf course. The type of golf center that we need should offer training for young golfers, the practice of fundamentals uh, and, and their golfing abilities something that could be worked out to facilitate uh, golf and curriculum at the university. The Red Reef Golf Facility does not have the space for a training center. The course is too short, limited space uh, for growth and both in the area of parking uh, as well. Uh, the best place to build a golfing training center to suit the needs of Boca Raton citizens would be on that portion, uh, previously Ocean Breeze, on the east side of 2nd Ave. <clears throat> the next uh, email is from um, the head of the Women's Ladies Championship Golf League. And um, this is uh, Cindy Tomeko. There seems to be an assumption that our beautiful Red Reef facility can, can substitute for a current Boca Municipal Golf Course. Perhaps we need to take a look at what comprises the quality executive course specifically uh, as it relates to a par three course. Um, Red Reef, while, the, while Red Reef is a gem, no way mimics the inclusive experience of a quality executive golf course. The length is too short, not challenging enough, and there are no practice accommodations. Additionally, backdrop is small and congested, 
There were no bag attendants. Carts are very limited and uh, parking uh, the facility is, is overwhelmed with the parking as it exists today. <clears throat> so I'm gonna shift gears here. I'm gonna send you the rest of the emails. I will not bore you reading them. Um, I've got a couple that are critical. Um, Joel Bowie, who is vice president of the Boca Golf Association uh, has written to you guys in the city council and he says, I've been following um, the, the city council members. I think the reasons they stated below the executive course and practice area, similar to the Price Fazio design and proper use on the east side of Second Ave. I think it is critical that the Greater Boca Raton Beach and Parks commissioners have something positive to show after spending three years and millions of taxpayer dollars. A really nice golf facility uh, would be a popular facility and a positive for Boca Raton and the Greater Boca Raton uh, Beach and Parks Commission. For several years, I've been following with great interest the Boca, R Boca Raton course saga. First, congratulations on obtaining the gift of Boca Country Club. That's terrific news. I believe the course will need some minor modifications with shorter tees, um, to be suitable for as a municipal course, uh, but that should be no problem and it's a first class facility that will be an asset to the city. I know you'll be meeting with Beach and Parks Commissioners to discuss the Ocean Breeze property. I strongly suggest that an executive course and practice area be considered for the property east on 2nd Ave. Um, Boca Raton has many golfers who prefer to play all of their golf on a shorter course for a variety of reasons, plus a proper executive course gives accomplished golfers the opportunity to play a quick round and, and work on their game. <clears throat> in, in a subsequent email, and I talked to a few of you commissioners over the weekend about your obligation to get approval to work on the east side. And I think there's a misunderstanding um, and I, I want to read uh, another note from Joel. The preamble to the city's interlocal agreement that requires the city's approval on the plans clearly omits the East parcel. It says, as you know, pursuant to resolution 10-2018, the city district enter into an interlocal agreement whereby the city provide the city provided $20 million in funding through a city issued bond financing to the district for the acquisition of Ocean, Ocean Breeze, golf, Breeze Golf Course. The district also acquired the former Ocean Breeze land east of 2nd Ave, point, uh, uh, plus or minus 72.53 acres directly from the seller without financing from the city. The city has no ownership interest in those lands and the interlocal agreement terms and conditions are not applicable to them. So uh, Jacob, I know you looked at some of this stuff uh, over the weekend and when I'm finished here in a couple of minutes, you'll feel free to respond. Um, in summary, Red Reef is too short uh, it's not challenging for the average golfer. There's no driving range and practice area. There's no learning center, no golf school, very limited parking, not enough golf carts, and a very limited capacity. Um, this morning, I did a public records request, and I'd like to share with you the amount of rounds played on all three courses, championship, executive, and Red Reef over the last two years. Uh, and again, um, I am sending you guys this email right, right as I finish speaking here. So 2019, the championship course um, had roughly 52,000 rounds on it. The executive course had roughly 21,000 rounds on it. And Red Reef had over 26,000 rounds on it. 2020, year to date, championship course, 46. 47,000 rounds, executive course, 20,000 rounds, and Red Reef, 22,000 rounds. 
and I, I need to caveat these numbers um, because the championship and the executive course include a 42 day closure due to the virus at the height of the season. So um, they are estimating uh, lost rounds on the championship course uh, of roughly 8,000 rounds on the executive course, 3,200 rounds and on red reef over 7,000 rounds. So you could add those to the year to day totals to uh, have some greater perspective on the volume of golf that's played in addition to the growth year over year. The last piece of information I wanna leave you with, and it's included in the email I'm sending you right now, is a screenshot of the scorecard at Boca Municipal Executive Course, which shows from the white tees all the way back 1,877 yards versus Red Reef, which some people think is an adequate replacement from the white tees all the way back 1,357 yards, over 500 yards difference on a nine, nine hole course is, is huge. Uh, with that, I will, I will wrap up and I'm sending you guys this email right now. Thank you. Greg, thank you very much. Uh, Brianne, you have another e um, email that has come in? I do. Um, this was after our time frame, but we're going to go ahead and read it online. Um, this is from Scott Conwell. As a resident of Boca Tica and East Boca who has discussed the area plan with many residents, we are celebrating the current opportunity to, opportunity to turn Boca Tica into a great recreational location, optimizing each half of the soon to be park, 130 acres west of 2nd Avenue and 70 acres east of 2nd Avenue next to the railroad tracks. As you know, on September 17th at the commission board meeting, I testified in favor of a recreational replacement for the old golf plan for this area with a vision of a patch reef park type family center in this la and this last opportunity to expand our field offerings for children and adults. Parks and Rec informed us the nearby Sand Pine Park fields are unavailable and there's currently a long waiting list for use of any Boca area fields. Incorporating a playground, outdoor rinks, soccer, box, lacrosse, and inline hockey, and unpaved mountain biking in the in the wild hiking, nature trails, jogging, hiking trails, I stated that these activities are least served and most needed by the current recreation menu and would be the biggest and most notable expansion of services offered to our residents. In addition to placing us on the map for offering recreation activities that are offered by few other cities and creating a central park type setting, these amenities can be used for renowned select tournaments and competitions, Scott Conwell. Thank you, Brian. Is there anybody else with a hand up? Let me check the list here. Okay. Uh, let me Seeing anybody with their hand raised. I have Mr. Chaffee muted. I don't, are you planning on speaking? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Name and address. Uh, okay. My name is Harold Chaffee. I'm the, the president of Keep Up in Boca. I'm 6200 Northwest 2nd Avenue. As you, then uh, the residents of Boca Tica and also uh, Keep Up in Boca were very disappointed and in shock actually with the decision that the city had made. Uh, there was no, uh, there was no, um, no real contact with anyone. It was just uh, out of the blue. You know, we, we get really depressed, we get disgusted, but you know what, we lick our wounds and we move on. And I, I, I have to concede to all the, the people who talked before me uh, more eloquently than I can talk. But I think that this area here, I think that there's a, is still a need for a, a nine hole, a driving range, uh, a learning center on this property. And then basically just taking a, a deep breath and leaving the, the west side, uh, basically just basically maybe do some little trails or something on the other side, but keep it in, in, in the, uh, in the bank, you know, don't use it. Don't do anything with it. Just basically keep it, see how things go with this, with the uh, new endeavor that the city is going to go into, which is acquiring this, uh, this large uh, piece of property, which basically uh, the, the predecessor was losing two and a half million dollars on just to keep it open. 
I don't know how they're going to do it, but uh, good luck. And uh, like I said, it's a great, it's a great asset to the city, uh, providing this use properly. And I, I, I think we should just uh, move forward and develop this land. I really do. It, and it's going to be a tremendous asset to the city. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Is there anyone else, Brianne? You're muted. Sorry, I do. Uh, phone number ending in 9508. I'm going to unmute you. If you'll state your name and address, please. Hello, this is Robert Ducate, 5351 Northwest Third Terrace. Hi, Mr. Ducate. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi, this must be uh, uh, unfortunately a somewhat disappointing. Uh, me, I'm sure for uh, most of the people on the uh, district, I know that the uh, a lot of residents uh, may have sent you some nasty emails or talking about they uh, betrayed us. But of course, uh, people who follow this closely know that the Beach and Park District was uh, uh, unfortunately heard about the rumors of the last few months and uh, were equally disappointed to hear the donation. But I think that uh, both as a Boca Tiga resident and as a golfer, it's important that we move forward and recognize that uh, the golf decision has been made and uh, golf uh, should not be a part of any new development plans. Uh, with regard to comments about the executive course and the lack of uh, the executive course being uh, available, I can tell you Red Reef is an excellent golf course for beginners and seniors. As a matter of fact, yesterday I played the Red Reef golf course uh, with a beginner and it's a great oceanside course. It was $10 for an out-of-state uh, uh, visitor to go and play that course. Maybe that's actually too low. Maybe that's why they're losing so much money. Also, for golfers who want a longer nine-hole course, there's an easy solution. The city can add senior tees on the course. Make it whatever yardage they want. If they want it to have the same yardage as what it was at uh, Boca Municipal, that's easy enough to do. There are a lot of uh, courses out, out there that have senior and junior tees markers out on the golf course. Plus, we all heard the city's loss of approximately $300,000 a year at the city's golf course was primarily due to the executive course, according to Lee Fennell's comments at the meeting last week. And in reference to waiting one year for uh, doing anything to the West course and continuing on, that's just absolutely does not make any sense. Uh, I would suggest that we take down the fences now, start irrigating the front of the, uh, of the property that you own on Yamato Road looks absolutely horrible. That needs to be re-landscaped and taken care of immediately. Uh, we have the ability, uh, as we talked about before, to use the current tennis courts at that location. Uh, since there's not going to be anything else uh, constructed on that uh, property, uh, I would suggest that we use that property for the tennis courts to be converted immediately to pickleball courts. There's a uh, parking lot right next door to facilitate that. And uh, waiting, we've already waited since the uh, middle of 2017 when this whole proposition was being discussed and the uh, Beach and Park District finally bought it. Lastly, regarding the uh, um, comments that uh, your attorneys have made regarding the deed restriction uh, for golf, uh, back in the middle of 2017, when this was being discussed by both the city as well as the Beach and Park District, the city attorney uh, drafted a, a memo at uh, one of the city council meetings and pointed out that uh, deed restrictions such as what we have here at Boca Tica, unfortunately, do not uh, apply to municipal owners such as the district. Uh, subsequently, uh, your attorney at the time, Art Kosky, agreed with that. And that's due to pre legal precedents, and I'm sure that your uh, legal advisors will uh, look into that further. So, uh, again, I think that there is a great opportunity. You do a great job of building parks. Uh, you built a great park at Red Reef. Uh, I'm sorry, at uh, Spanish River, the Dehornley Park. Sugar Sands a great park. Uh, there's a lot of uh, wish list items in my little community in uh, my section of Boca Tica. We had about 25% of the people come up with suggestions. Some of them were similar, some of them were different, but there is a need to have a committee started with residential input so that when you do set up uh, plans, 
uh, these will be able to be implemented uh, on, on a community-wide basis. But it's not just for the people in Boca Tica. Even though I'm a resident of Boca Tica, I can tell you that, of course, this is for all of the residents of the city, including, of course, nearby Hidden Valley and all the homes in between there. So again, I uh, I know I have been one of the I was one of the first people to uh, su- suggest that uh, district uh, purchase the property, and I'm very grateful for the district for purchasing the property. But I think it's important that uh, residents move forward, and this can be a great uh, park. I mean, we look at what you what great parks you have built, and I'm looking forward to seeing a great park built here. Thank you for your time and all your all your cooperation. Thank you, Mr. Decade. Is there anyone else, Brian? Uh, let me look. I see nobody else with their hands raised. All righty. Public requests are now closed. It's time for the approval of the minutes of the regular virtual meeting that was held on October 5th, 2020. We found on page three of your agenda packet. Do I hear a motion to approve? So moved. Thank you. A second, please. I'll second. Thank you, Mr. Rollins. A- any discussion, commissioners? Hearing none. Joanne, would you please do a roll call vote? Or Commissioner Ernst? You're muted, Craig. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Engel? Yes. Commissioner Rollins? Yes. Commissioner Volvesang? Yes. And Commissioner Wright? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Our first item of regular business is the golf course dis- discussion on page seven of your agenda packet. Brianne, would you start us off and then we'll go to Mr. Gorin. Sure. Commissioners, in your packet, starting on page seven, I've included a copy of the um, our, the deed restriction memo from our legal counsel, as well as the current ILA. I think it's uh, last, last week, the city accepted the gift of a golf course. Obviously there's a conversation to be had about what to do with Boca Tica, but before we start that conversation, we are held by an interlocal agreement. We have not received any communication from the city regarding that interlocal agreement. So I wanted Sam and Jacob, if he wants to join in, Mr. Gorn and Mr. Horwitz to kind of talk about where we are legally, as far as what we can do and can't do before we start planning, um, what to do with Boca Tica. So I'll turn it over to Mr. Gorin. May I speak, Madam Chair? Welcome, Mr. Gorin. Nice good, to good evening, you. Madam Chair. Commissioners, good evening as well. Welcome to Monday evening. Um, since the public disclosure of the donation offering um, of the Boca Golf Course to the City Council, which was, I believe, accepted this past week by the City Council, uh, we have done some homework and some research and would like to offer up the following information for you as you begin to deliberate on the subject of the golf course further. Uh, Number one is the fact that the the interlocal agreement was entered into in 2018, was entered into in good faith. It's a mutually beneficial document. It is a binding, enforceable, and legally legal contractual relationship between the Boca Park District and the city of Boca Raton. Uh, Nothing with regard to the donation offering or the city's acceptance of a donation uh, has any contractual legal impact on the current agreement, which exists between both the district and the city. That, that the, the, the ILA, which is made part of the packages this evening that Brianne attached to the, to the agenda, again, is a legally binding and enforceable document. It's an interlocal agreement pursuant to state statute, pursuant to chapter 163, which contemplates relationships such as this between local governments, not private parties, local governments. Um, and there are certain terms and conditions and provisions in the interlocal agreement, which remain in play as we speak this evening. The consequence of which is that the district has in good faith engaged uh, after a search of the Price Fazio firm, a qualified golf course developer. Um, We worked together, Jacob and I, along with uh, your staff uh, to negotiate with and to conclude an agreement. I think Jake, we we finalized the document probably a year and a half ago round numbers. Uh, essentially to engage Price Fazio to assist the district in the design and construction of a golf course with regard to the transaction contemplated between the city and the district. And that contract is still in place. And the dis- district has expended money, public, public, public money, 
um, and the, uh, the folks from Price Fazio have performed their functions in accordance with their agreement with the district as well. One of the things that, that Price Fazio was obligated to do and which contracted this, the, the, the district was incl inclined and intended to do was to submit a site plan or a master plan to the city. You may all remember that you all voted on. In fact, there were public discussions, public meetings, uh, public input, even joint meetings with the, with the city council in Boca Raton, evidencing the, the interest in the district in submitting a plan for consideration by the city of Boca Raton. And if I'm not mistaken, sometime in March of this year before the pandemic became um, a, a, a limiting factor in some instances of public life, um, this, the district in good faith submitted a site plan, master plan to the city for its review and approval. You may remember that in the language of the in-local agreement, which is a mutually beneficial document to both the city and the district, there's language which says that if and when the district submits a plan, that that plan shall be reviewed by the city and shall not the, the consent or approval of which shall not be unreasonably withheld. That's in the document, it runs to both parties. So as we speak this evening, there is an existing interlocal agreement. The donation offering and the donation acceptance has little to do with the contractual obligation which exists between both the district and the city. And as far as I can tell, given the tenor of tonight's discussion, which will uh, evolve from this discussion I'm offering up tonight, along with any comments that Jake may like to offer, um, is a binding and enforceable document between the parties. Uh, I'll hasten to add that um, there are and maybe other options to consider which are policy-based. Um, I'm, I'm looking at not the policies, which I don't get to create as, as your lawyer, as we do as your attorneys, but you do as, your, as the public officials. But in the context of the relationship, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, the city has made its own decision regarding the acceptance of a donation. And I, I don't choose to, to, to kick any sand in the face of anybody, but I, I've reviewed that donation agreement. I, I saw it when it was online and saw it as part of the package before the city council last week. It was a well-drafted, uh, well thought through, comprehensive document that didn't happen overnight. I'm sure the parties uh, discussed it, negotiated it, uh, vetted it, uh, exposed it, measured it in many, many different ways before that document was finalized. I'll also say, by the way, that the law firms involved that helped to create it are very credible, thoughtful, uh, respectable law firms. The Aikerman Law Firm, in fact, does legal work for, for our law firm in the city of Pembroke Pines and litigation currently pending in that city against a, a third party. And the Weiss Road Firm does a lot of the same kind of work that we do, highly respected in the field of governmental practice. So irrespective of what the donation agreement does or implies to do or requires to do, the interlocal that, that this district has with the city continues unabated, notwithstanding the, the, the donation agreement. And briefly, if I can, with regard to the, the, um, the issue of deed restrictions, um, uh, yes, there is a memo in, in the backup in the file. We did look at the deed restrictions that do exist. Um, and although I'm not prepared this evening to answer any specific questions, there, there is some case law out there. I've yet to actually physically see uh, the memorandum that's referred to by Mr. Duquette uh, issued by the city attorney in Boca. I'm happy to read it when it's available. Um, I don't know that ever any, anyone was ever issued uh, by our predecessor, Mr. Koski, although I believe he was uh, told to have uh, concurred in the in analysis. And the theory of the of the deed restrictions is that, that as to a governmental entity, that if a governmental entity acquire, acquires property by voluntary acquisition, as opposed to condemnation, which is taking a private property for a public purpose, that it's, it's highly likely under the case decision, or at least it's an argument that can be raised, that the uh, deed restrictions uh, do not run against the government. So that's the legal theory. I'm not prepared to articulate that as an express conclusion this evening. There is case law out there, which we've isolated. I would like to look at the opinion issued to the city of Boca Raton by their city attorney. I don't have a corner of the market on brains. I'm happy to be educated. If, I've, if we have missed something in the context of our analysis, I'm happy to look into the subject matter when, when asked to do so for any, any further. But that's the predicate for perhaps your, your, more lar your larger discussion. I know that, that each of you has your own individual view of the subject matter. I've had some private conversations with each of you in some respects over the past number of days and weeks. Um, and to that extent, I'm happy to answer any questions or so is Jake in the context of the, the current legal status that we're in. What we don't want to do as a public body is to engage in a in, in behavior or in actions that would invalidate or would breach that agreement that I just referred to, which is currently not in breach. And you are, you are not in breach of that document. In fact, you're fulfilling its term conditions and provisions as we speak this evening without any equivocation or reservation. And all I can suggest to you is that there's pending an application right now in the city. And we would hope at, at some point in time that we're directed as, as professional staff um, to implement a, a response back or to seek a response back from the city 
to find out where we are with that situation. Um, because that is a pending issue that you've complied with, the city needs to comply with it on an equal uh, and measured basis as well. I'm happy to answer any questions you have, and I thank you for listening. This is a very sensitive topic. It's obvious that um, a lot of public money has been spent to get to this point of the conversation, uh, and, and you are fiduciaries, you are responsible as public officials, and you've been responsible, and I, we expect as your lawyers to keep you responsible as well in all the ways we possibly can to maintain the same level of good faith you offered when you signed that document uh, today as well. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Gorin. Um, I'd like to open this up to the commissioners since we have not had an opportunity to discuss anything uh, in the past two weeks. Um, uh, Commissioner Wright, you have your hand yeah. up? Yeah, I just had a question for Sam or Jacob, whoever. Um, in regards to Mr. Koski, I remember this topic came up. Does he have any documentation in regards to this topic? on the deed restriction? I mean, he must have. We've asked, if I may respond, Madam Chair. Okay. Uh, and Jake may, have, may, may reply separately, but but I'm not aware of any written memorandum that was authored by your prior general counsel on the specific subject of those deed restrictions. There might have been some oral commentary on the subject, but I'm not aware of any written document. And that's one of the things that's I'd right. like to look for and inquire of further of uh, Mr. Koski, if available. Jacob, do okay. you add to that? No, I, just to follow up on that point, I seem to recall in June of last year when we were first asked to look into the deed of restrictions that resulted in the memorandum included in your backup, we asked that question of Mr. Koski, and as Sam said, I don't recall that there was anything in writing at that time, but we'd like to dig, dig a little deeper on that point. And I know that he's recently transitioned a number of files to, um, you know, to the district, and I know that Brianne has been going through those files. Um, perhaps there's something in there that might shed a little light on this discussion. Would there be okay. something in the um, in the meeting minutes in the documentation of the meeting, Brianne? You're muted. You're muted. I will. We'll go through those meeting minutes. I I actually sent Joanne a message already to start looking for that. I remember it being discussed. I don't remember him writing anything specific about it, but we'll go back and and he did just deliver a lot of files here, so we can look. Uh, you had your hand up, Commissioner Rollins. <clears throat> yes, Sam. So uh, what you're saying is that uh, we need to hear from the city uh, to uh, comply with their part of the agreement, which is uh, approval of the site plan, which uh, approval would not be unreasonably withheld. So what happens uh, when they give us the approval? Are we obligated to do the uh, golf course based on the design that was submitted? May I respond, Madam Chair? Absolutely. Thank yes, you. the answer is that that it, that, that a, an agreement a, a, or a contract runs to, to both parties on an equal basis. You're 100 percent correct. If, if you in good faith, you the district as a public entity um, engage the third party to assist you in preparing a site plan and a master plan for a golf course with various amenities and under the terms of the interlocal agreement, which is a written contract, uh, submitted a proposal for consideration by your your alleged partner, which is what is contemplated by the agreement. Uh, then the answer is that that you you might well be then obligated to fulfill your side of the equation, which is to do what's next under the document, whatever those terms and conditions require. So the answer is yes. Um, an agreement runs to both parties equally, and to the extent that you have a submittal with the city, that the city could now turn around and say yes or no, depending upon their their point of reference. At the moment, as not not mistaken, through Brianne to the chair and to yourself, Commissioner, um, I think that the plan was submitted. As, as recently as March and is still pending for review by the city or by professional staff. The, the last thing we got from the city in writing was on August 24th um, that they had scheduled discussion for September 22nd city council meeting and they were going to discuss the proposed improvements for the property at that meeting and then later we received a call prior to that meeting that it would not be on the agenda. We don't have anything in writing from that but that, that was the last correspondence in writing about it. Hmm. So um, there is no provision in the ILA, Mr. Gorin, for it, even if they give the approval for us to say, okay, now we've fulfilled the contract on both sides or we haven't fulfilled the contract on both sides if we don't um, develop the golf course on the west side. Couple of observations, and I, I was not physically there, nor was Jacob when, when the agreement was negotiated. But there are some very uniquely clear terms in the in the findings provision, the whereas paragraphs. And one of the key provisions of the document speaks to the fact that the district has declared 
its intent to develop a championship caliber golf course and related recreational facilities on the property and the property is a defined term. So at the time that the agreement was signed off on in February of 2018, there was a demonstrated intention on the, on the part of the district to do just that. Correspondingly, there were commitments contained in the agreement that the city itself had committed <coughs> to fulfilling as well in the context of its obligations. So there, there needs to be some huge mutual agreement as to what would happen next, but the end result is, is that there was an intent uh, to do that. Um, second part of which is the fact that um, you have in, in, in weeks and in months past talked about the term, you've used the term partnership between the district and the city. Um, and, and how you each define partnership is defined differently by each of you perhaps, but the agreement does, does by its own terms um, commit to a partnership relationship and also the, op the, the opportunity um, for the purposes of pr providing for um, this as an amenity, not just to the city of Boca Raton, but also to the district and, and the, the folks that would be served by its creation of, of this amenity. So there's a mutual term that would need to be looked at there. Uh, I have a question. Uh, Mr. Engel had his hand up. I'm sorry, Commissioner Wright. I'll get to you next. Um, My hand up. <laughs> we have a, uh, as part of the ILA, the city has to give approval of the site plan that we submitted. Now we submitted a site plan for the entirety, both east and west side. Um, does the ILA, the way it's presently constituted, provide for splitting off the east side that we own outright uh, for and submitting approval for the design of the east side? Or do, does is the city required to approve the entirety uh, of, of the site plan, both east and west. Go ahead. Go ahead. There's, there's, there's two ahead, different site plan yeah. approvals. Right. There, there's the, the site plan approval that Wayne has put through the, pro, the process of the city and permitting, which is the entire east and west. Right. But for our purposes of getting approval, we were seeking approval of the west side. Yeah. If I may, just to follow up on that point. Please do. The ILA speaks to the property, which is defined as the west side, and the district owned property, which is defined as the east side. The provision that Brianne just referenced spoke to improvements on the property, which is the west side, which are subject to city council approval, which may not unreasonably with, be withheld. But the same condition does not apply to improvements on the east side, which is the district acquired property. So we can, if we decide, and I'm just putting this out there for argument's sake, so please sure. uh, don't anybody jump down my throat. If we decide we want to build an 80,000 seat uh, football stadium on the east side, the uh, deed restriction notwithstanding, we have that right to do without any approval from city council. Generally, if I may respond, generally speaking, yes, subject to whatever the requirements are for permitting and the, and the like, which would, be, which would be a city function that would have to be uh, called upon for that purpose. Yes. Right. You certainly have a, fr a freer hand on the east side than on the west side. Okay. So it, it's conceivable then that regardless of what is done with the west side, we could build an executive golf course, a driving range, and a practice area on the east side without having to go through the city, except for permitting. Except for, if I may, Madam Chair, except for those require permits for either from the city or from, from various and sundry governmental agencies that would require it, um, an application to be filed and approved, yes. Okay, so um, it's feasible for us then if we decided as a body to build those three facilities on the east side for us to do it. Theoretically, yes. Okay, thanks. Sorry, Commissioner Wright, uh, and then I'll get to you, Commissioner Ernst. Um, you have your hand up, Commissioner Wright. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I just had a question on the ILA. If, if both parties agreed, um, would it be something that we could go back to the ILA to adjust it based on the circumstances that have occurred without yeah. having to wait for their approval on the site plan? Can we go? You know what I mean? I do. And if I can respond, Madam Chair, uh, you, raise, you raise a very uniquely important aspect of discussion with regard to interlocal agreements. The, the state statute governing ILAs 
is actually in state law. And this agreement is governed by state law. And it's something which enables local governments and governmental agencies to engage in discussions to protect the public interest. And that's what this document does. It's intended to do something for the public interest and to protect the public interest. So um, you have to have mutual understanding, mutual cooperation and mutuality of obligation in a, in a contract. It can't be one sided per se uh, in, in the context of having such a document under, under the statute. At least that's not what's con not contemplated. So I've said a lot of words to get to the conclusion, but if, if, if it be the wish of the city and the district open up discussions to modify this agreement, that's certainly within within the, the ambit of opportunities between both parties. Not 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 with with with, pit, with pitchforks and, and, and lanterns, but but to have an actual discussion that that's that's logically possible. And remember, if you will, and we're we're not sleeping under a rock here, there's been a set of new facts and circumstances that have occurred over the past number of days that didn't happen a month ago or six months right. ago. And 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 that's something which which, which is a factor that, that may, may engender some more discussion if, if, this, if this part of the equation is willing, and them as well. Okay. Commissioner uh, Ernst had his hand up and then I'll get to you, Mr. Rollins. So Aaron kind of hit upon what I was interested in, but I kind of want to focus more on a, a going forward and, and understand the ILA itself, um, Sam, we have an ILA in place. And if right now we have a plan presented to the city. So the next step on this whole thing is let's let's be realistic here. There's a there's a the contractual part and there's the reality of a real world part. And the reality of a real world part is it makes not a lot of sense for the um, city and the district to have competing golf courses within two miles of one another. I think we all accept that fact. Um, given that. I think more thought needs to be done with what will happen at the Boca Tica area and what will go in in the future. So the next logical step here is to not negotiate the major changes to the terms, but to give us some relief in the sense that um, we, we probably need to reconsider the plans that were submitted and that requires an ILA amendment. And so I, to me, it makes the most sense for um, either the city to propose that ILA amendment or uh, us to propose it, but with dialogue between Brianne and her counterpart at the city. So first and foremost, you know, there's no reason for them to approve a whole site plan. We just need a little bit of deferral time on it. Alternatively, just so I can make sure I understand the other option of it, if they don't give us that option, um, and we choose not to build, you know, go forward with our plans. It sounds like we're potentially in default of the ILA agreement and in potentially the city could take that um, west side property if we chose to withdraw our golf plan facilities. Is that correct? Gordon? That's possible. I, I'm not gonna put you under the bus legally, but the answer is, could, could, could the city assert that you're not complying with the agreement? The answer is they can make that assertion, whether it's okay. true or not, I'm not sure, but they could assert it, they could, they so, could allege it. Okay, so my comments are back to our, my fellow commissioners then, is that one thing, I, there's, two, there's a couple good things out of this that came about. One is the city got an incredible opportunity to get this golf course, which is very large, very massive, and it is a new opportunity and it's built. It's done. They paid nothing for it. Um, we spent 24 million for our golf course, plus 2 million, plus some other things just to do all this. So we're, we're the harmed party in this whole program. Unbeknownst to us, we were harmed, but for the greater community, this is a good thing. So, you know, my take on this whole thing is, is that we need to, the, the key, there's two key things I heard is one, they got this great gift. And number two, I want to put the point of, Everything I've heard from the city council, and I did attend the meeting, is they want a stronger, better, greater working relationship with this district. And I think that is a beautiful starting point. So I don't see them going down the path of a default and doing all these things. I think the next step is put a simple amendment into the ILA um, to, with, I guess, ultimately withdraw what we submitted. Um, I, I personally do like the, you know, the the learning course center and the driving range and the short course, they all make good sense right now at this point. But I think we all have to kind of step back just a tad bit and 
get with the city. And I personally expect that the city will take a lead effort in both showing us what has come through on the needs assessment, and then we all have to assess it. And the community there in Boca Tica has to be heavily involved in it to say, what do we ultimately want to be there? And give it a little bit of time and make a call out for it. And I will remind everyone that I never went along with this $24 million golf course purchase without the concept of some kind of revenue. And there's a couple things we learned afterwards is one, there's going to be a no hotel. We tore down the hotel facility, so we lost that right. But guess what? In today's environment, there is no chance of another hotel being built in that area for the next 10 years. There's just no demand. So that's gone. So I think we need to enlist, you know, some kind of opportunities. What are the, we have to have a call out for things of what are the ideas? And there may be some good ideas that come forward on it. Um, a, th a third component of it, no idea what's going on with Clinton Moore or Jeffrey Street. I think it'd be clarity around that would be helpful. But all of these things kind of come back to the city. And so I would personally like to see us work very closely with the city and put the burden back to the city to say, what can we what can we and what should they collectively what should we all develop in this site here and how will it look i have no idea at this point but i can tell you i don't think we're going to be building an 18 hole golf course i think we all accept that fact and the important part is is get your ila kind of amendment in place step back get agree upon some time frame to reassess what we're doing and to the poor folks in boca tica we need to get something you know going out there, but it has to be with an overall plan, not a hodgepodge piece where we're doing it one piece at a time that doesn't fit together. And to me, the city is the next step. We spent you know, well over 2 million tearing out the hotel and designing everything. I think it's on their burden now to um, put together some of the planning, the time and what will go out there and let them take some of that lead to do that. Just my thoughts, so. Thank you, Mr. Ernst. Mr. Rollins, you had your hand up. Uh, just a quick follow-up to Craig's. If, if, if there's a thought of having the city <clears throat> involved in the design and so forth, I want to see their money um, because we've spent way too much money to have walked away from uh, a design. Uh, so I, I understand the city uh, listening to the, uh, uh, the Zoom meeting wants uh, better relationships with the, uh, the district, and I think we all do. I've been trying to do that for 24 years. Um, but to, Sam, to your question, uh, to a question, um, you pointed out uh, in the contract, you know, the design approval would not be unreasonably withheld. Yes, sir. Uh, and, and this is a, a legal opinion that you may or may not want to offer, but are, are, is the city in breach of contract at this point? Madam Chair, may I respond? Please do, Mr. Gorin. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Commissioner, I, I, I respect and care for you immeasurably, and I, I would not choose to disrespect you by not answering your question, but uh, I don't have enough facts this evening to answer that question rationally and, and, and in, a, in a fashion which would be protective of the, of the district's interests. But I will tell you that, um, that the simple fact that the city of Boca Raton has engaged in a what appears to be a fairly long-term discussion with a third party for a donation is not in and of itself a premise for a breach of this agreement. As I said in, in the beginning to, to you and to, to your membership, um, it is Jake's and my belief that, that this agreement is binding and enforceable. It is not in breach by either party, that each party is operating in good faith, at least to date, irrespective of what might've occurred last Thursday with the city's acceptance of the donation. Uh, and absent a specific fact or circumstance which would indicate that they've not complied, um, I'm assuming for discussion, I don't like to assume anything by the way, but based on the current discussion we're having, um, we're expecting a response back from the city based upon the submittal. And unless the district through its policy making role, which you all have, uh, consistent with Commissioner Ernst's uh, commentary a few mom moments ago, the document uh, is a document in play. You could change the document by mutual, mutual agreement. You could change it. You could change the texture of it, the destination of it. And as Jake aptly pointed out to me this afternoon, there's language on page, page 14 of the document um, at subparagraph F, which actually in parentheses talks about the following. Prior to commencement of operations of the property, capital P is a defined term, as a golf course, parens, 
or for other public purposes slash activities, close parens. There's something in this document that actually opens up a portal for a, a, a consideration for other public uses. It's not express, it's referred to in parentheses, but it is there. Um, um, I would like not to suggest that, that the city's in breach and, and again, simply engaging in a, accepting a donation of property in and of itself is not a breach, but failure to comply with the terms of this, this agreement could constitute a breach in the future. Thank and you. I would just add the language that Sam just read into the record refers to the property, which is defined to be the west, west side. West side. Right. Well, just just following up on that, I mean, <clears throat> it had to be a question that we needed to ask, given the time and uh, resources that we've invested in this project, Sam. Yes. Uh, and which is the reason why I suggested that. Uh, and to Aaron's question, she beat me to the punch about uh, whether we could modify it. But I think in the modification of this, if it's a mutual thing, there's still damages that uh, one party has sustained that the other has not. And that's the, uh, the resources that, I mean, we're on the hook for $19 million, uh, less the payments that we've made uh, at the request of, of the city to purchase this property. Uh, we borrowed the money. Um, and we spent, oh, I'm not sure what the, the costs were to the architects and supporting uh, crew, but it seemed like it's somewhere close to a million dollars that we have invested in this project. Uh, and it would seem to me that uh, uh, the, the worthy thing to do of a business partner would be to cover those damages if in fact uh, the other party has done something that uh, creates uh, uh, an untenable situation for us in trying to develop a golf course. Madam, Madam Chair, may I respond to the commissioner because he points to a very important uh, reference piece. Um, you're, you're speaking about potentially bad faith negotiations or having entered into an agreement that's assumed to be based upon good faith, but because of certain conditions would exemplify the potential for bad faith dealings. I'm not prepared to argue that this evening, but I know it's a concept of the law that could be employed in this discussion. Mm -hmm. You know, whether or not the city was uh, engaging in its own negotiations, contrary to the good faith that was otherwise required to impose in this agreement. Um, that's possible. I would suggest that that's a, um, uh, a, 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 an argument that shouldn't be cast asunder. It's one that should be thought about and should be preserved because under Florida law, um, if the facts reveal that there was bad faith dealing on the part of the city, and I hate to say this publicly, but I have to, um, that, that would put the, the district at risk and induce the district into expending public money, uh, for a purpose that couldn't be complied with because of that poten potential bad faith. That's an issue we'd have to look at at some future moment. Thank you, Mr. Gorin. Uh, Mr. Engel, you have your hand up. Yeah, um, a couple of things I wanna, I, I'd like to point out. Um, first, the reality is, as we've all acknowledged, the city uh, received a donation of property being an 18 hole golf course. That being said, the other reality is that uh, because they have that golf course, likely they will not approve our golf course design. And their reason being they already have another golf course. So we can forget about ever building an 18 hole golf course on the west side of the property. Uh, on the east side, as I mentioned before, we can do pretty much what we want, but I think it would behoove us to uh, work with the city uh, in developing a plan for that development. Uh, also, uh, what uh, Commissioner Rollins brought up, whether they're in material breach, uh, that's a good point. And, um, I think the city should be transparent in uh, the uh, evolution of this deal. How did it happen? How long has it been going on? Um, because that's material to our well-being has been brought up. I, I, I would say we spent close on to $2 million on this project. Uh, and that's $2 million that is as... Uh, uh, Sam brought up, that's public money. And we have responsibility to the public as to how how our money was spent. And if this money was spent climbing up uh, a, a tree 
that uh, we'll never see the fruit of, um, then that, that's something that needs to be dealt with. Uh, that being said, I do not want to go down the path of litigating with the city because that only creates more bad blood and we have enough bad blood as it is. And I just wanted to throw in uh, my 28 cents worth. Thank you, Steve. Mr. Rollins? Well, my, my 30 cents is, will follow, Steve. Uh, I, I, I think that uh, the uh, gift was a godsend for the city uh, and the golfers. I, I think it was a, a good deal uh, I'm just thinking of trying to keep uh, make the district whole in this process by asking the questions that I did. Um, you know, there's um, a, a, lo a lot of things that are still uh, undisclosed, like the financial condition of uh, the golf course. Uh, I I've, I've heard uh, conversation from council that the user fees are going to cover the expense of maintaining a championship golf course. I hope so. Uh, I hope they can do it. Uh, but I, I think that, um, you know, we need to uh, try to find a way. I, to your point, Steve, I don't, I don't want to litigate either. Uh, I hope that in, in our efforts to modify the terms of this agreement that we can find uh, some compatibility from the city to help us with some of the loss that we've sustained. Uh, and, if we, and if they were to give us approval and we were to build this golf course, to Craig's point, we would not probably not be in a position to have the resources from user fees to cover the uh, expense because of the competing golf courses that we have. Um, I think it's great that the golf course uh, was acquired. It provides immediate uh, relief to the golfers uh, once Spokane Municipal sale has been consummated. But at the other hand, uh, we spent an awful lot of time and a lot of effort and uh, the public's money. And I think that uh, while it's a good deal for the, the city to uh, bask in the glow of uh, having made a good uh, decision to acquire the course, I, I think they need to consider uh, the position that we've been put in with the public uh, and the resources that uh, uh, we have, uh, have lost. And then I like the uh, fact that uh, the east side, we've always been able to make our own decision over there. And I think that uh, so long as there's enough space there to accommodate an executive course um, like they have at Boca Community with that, with that range of style, I think we should have that on the east side. One thing that I think is critical to us developing the east side is getting the abandonment of Jeffrey Street. With a road bifurcating that property, it does limit what we can do, uh, the size and scope of the driving range, uh, and then uh, having a, a, a major thoroughfare running through there, because once it's uh, four-laned, um, you know, that that's, uh, could be a, a safety hazard. And I hope that the, the city will uh, realize and recognize the letter from the uh, Seacoast Railroad that they didn't think that was going to be possible, and go ahead and cooperate with us and abandon that uh, that property. So summary, I, I like the deal. I wish I knew more about the deal. I wish it had been more transparent. Uh, um, if it had been the district doing the deal, you know we would have had to be transparent uh, and we would have. I understand the sensitivity of the matter, but it was the worst kept secret in, in, uh, in Boca in my opinion, uh, but no one was uh, owning up to it, even though the negotiations as Sam has said uh, through his review of the documents, it was very well thought out uh, legal document making the transaction between the two parties. So um, that's my 30 cents, Steve. Thank you, Commissioner Rollins. Um, would it make any sense, commissioners, for us to direct our, our council to meet with the city att attorney? And um, kind of hammer out some of the points and see what her opinion is and um, then come back to us about what our options might be. Um, I'm just throwing that out there. Uh, and Brianne, you wanted to clarify something for the, the public? 
I just want to clarify because everybody's talked about the resources that we've spent and it is around 2 million, but I don't want everybody to think it's been 2 million on design. We've spent about 850,000 on design, 350,000 on the maintenance of the course, which is like cutting the grass, trimming the trees, fencing, all that stuff. And then um, another 730 on the um, demolition when there Thank was you. on the, so I just want to clarify those numbers. Okay. Thank you. Can I make a motion to, I think the first step really is to have a um, brand go have a conversation with, um, with Leaf, Mike, um, to look at amending the ILA. I think that would be the first step. Um, and then obviously sorting out the, um, on the, on the attorney side would be sorting out the deed restriction, right? I mean, we have to get like a final a final answer on that because if we're restricted to doing only golf on there then we are i mean i don't want to say it but we're in a pool hole like we're you know i mean um so i think but amending the ila is definitely the first thing because we don't want to wait any longer um for the for the city to have to come to us we want to go to them and say okay there's been some changes, obviously, we all know that. Let's amend the ILA, work together um, to amend the ILA for, to, but then again, do we need to do the deed restriction first before we can amend the ILA? Madam Chair, if I can respond briefly. Thank you, Mr. Gorin, please do. Thank you, and, and Commissioner Wright's on, um, is a, uh, also a valid point. Um, we as your lawyers are happy to meet with the city's attorney at any moment of time at your direction to, to begin a conversation regarding a potential modification to the interlocal agreement. We're prepared to have that discussion, but we're not the policymakers, we're your lawyers. Um, the policies are established by you as a group of five, uh, a majority of five or a majority of three, as the case may be, uh, through the efforts of your executive director. Um, it, it, the better suggestion perhaps might be, uh, Commissioner Wright would be if, if you were to, to request um, that that, that uh, Brianne meet with her counterpart at the city, along with council, oh. we would, we'd certainly accompany her to that discussion and have, have that, that discussion. Um, I'm sorry, I mean, thought that's what I said. I thought I well, said Brianne. Did I say Brianne or did I say no, the attorneys? I'm no, sorry. No, you said, you said Brianne, but we, we would, okay. we would we, you could either send her alone, which is up to the board, or you could send mm -hmm. her along with us. But I think you're in a very uniquely different situation today than you were a week ago. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that, that it's called change circumstances. You're in a different place, not you, but the facts are in a different place than they were since last Thursday. Uh, mm -hmm. You have, a, again, a valid and binding agreement, but the terms of the, of the facts that surround the city's destination may be different than it was you know, a week before. So we're happy to meet along with uh, Brianne and with staff at the city, uh, with the city attorney at any moment of time to have a conversation that would uh, open up the door for discussion um, uh, with regard to potential modification, if that's what the, what the board would like for us to do. Um, and also to share uh, our legal research with that of the city attorney's office regarding uh, the impact of potential case law that may have, uh, because the government owns the property, uh, may have nullified or otherwise neutralized the deed restrictions. And if we can agree on that, that's a better front to have that agreement with the city attorney now than not have it down the road where we right. embark on a, on a process. And then they say, well, wait a minute, you, you, you have to do the following uses and not, not other uses. I would prefer to have that agreement up front. Okay. So, okay. So I guess my motion would be to have Brianne and the city attorneys or sorry, not the city attorneys, but our attorneys go and discuss the deed restriction and the amendment to the ILA based on, um, I guess that would be a long meeting, but uh, I, don't, I don't. May I say something before you uh, make the motion? I, actually, Mr. Rollins is the the next one to speak. Okay. Mr. Rollins. Um, Aaron, were you finished? I know you were interrupted there. Yeah, I mean, I just think we need to get that sorted. Yeah, I I, I was going to say uh, uh, that uh, I, I like your motion. I think that uh, Brienne uh, and uh, Sam or Jake. Uh, should go and meet with uh, Leaf and uh, their counsel to see about uh, getting their receptibility to modifying this agreement uh, to where mm -hmm. um, we we don't have to wait for their approval to get a golf course and for them to tell us yes or no. Let's just try to figure out a way to uh, um, you know modify the agreement as such that we continue uh, our coverage of the debt service, uh, but we need to know uh, we need to be 
out of the uh, issue of having to develop a golf course, uh, as, as we've discussed. Madam Chair, if I can, Commissioner Rollins, when he's, when he's done. Sure. And then, and then of course, uh, simultaneously to uh, getting that meeting set up either before and hopefully before investigating whether or not that deed restriction is applicable. I think that's, I think those two things are important if we can um, get those issues set, set up and resolved. Is that your second, Mr. Rollins? Yes, I, I was seconding uh, Aaron Wright's. Sorry for the long-winded second. Good. M right. Madam Chair, on, on the second, I think it's important to note for Mr. Rollins' benefit, and I recognize his, his many years of service on, on, on this, this board. Um, if, if this motion is adopted by the board and whether Jake or I are collectively, we meet with the city attorney and the city manager in Boca, um, let it be said clearly and unequivocally that that, that meeting is not, um, does not in any way, shape or form uh, diminish any rights or claims that this district may have with regard to its preserved rights where there may have been some issues between the city and the district that would otherwise be um, theoretically um, uh, eliminated by an, by, by, by an amendment to the agreement. Um, we're not waiving any rights to have that conversation. I'm not suggesting that, that there are um, claims that, 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 that exist or don't exist, but if there are claims, we're not waiving them just to have a sit down conversation with the city. But I think it, it again, change conditions and change circumstances around us have an effect upon this agreement and, and, and either our ability to fulfill it or the city's. And that's why the meeting, if the motion is adopted, would be worth having without waiving anybody's rights. Mr. Ernst. Um, well, I'm comfortable with Brianne going and having the initial discussion. I, I, I take the different approach on the inviting uh, Sam and Jake along. It's kind of like bringing your lawyers along. It, it's not um, very friendly. And I think it's hard enough to get with the city to um, do anything. And so I'd rather not try to limit it to they have to have a council, we have council, those kind of things. Those are all things that happen after you get agreement on the basic concepts of the interlocal agreement. And the very it's a very simple thing of what we have to talk about. And I think it will be, you'll get better dialogue, better conversation with um, Brianne leading that conversation with them. She'll get the feedback direction and then she can engage council to for either us to draft something or expand that next step. And I don't know that the city is ready to where they're at for our research. So I, I wouldn't want to put them in a spot to uh, force anything on that. Yes, it all has to be done, but it will happen in time. Let's immediately just get the ILA straightened out. And what are we doing? Uh, what we've submitted Right now, there's a, a clock ticking on it, and I think we need to um, stop the clock and you know have that conversation. And I think that's best handled with Brianne and her counterpart at the city. Mr. Engel. Yeah, um, I have to respectfully disagree with Commissioner Ernst. I think having attorneys uh, present from both sides will expedite uh, the situation because now we can look at not only what we like in, in the, in the uh, revised ILA, but what the legal ramifications are. Uh, I don't want Brianne to come back and say, okay, we discussed X, only to find out that from a legal standpoint, X might not be the best way to go. So I'd rather have it done all in one fell swoop, uh, uh, have Brianne there with e either Jake or Sam or both and have uh, Diane sitting on the other side of the table. It, it doesn't need to be hostile. It doesn't need to be um, uh, something that's, uh, that will create enmity. It can, it can be a very amicable meeting, but I'd like to get everything hashed out all at one time rather than have to go back and forth. Thank you, Mr. Engel. Yes, Mrs. Wright. Well, I was just going to say, I, I think our attorneys are some of the nicest people in the world, Craig, come on. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I just, the only reason I suggested them be, I totally think that Brianne could discuss the ILA with Mike on her own. That's absolutely fine. I know she would be comfortable with that. The only reason I suggested them be there was uh, in terms of the deed restriction side of it, if they were to discuss that. Um, but then again, they could request the information from the city attorneys via email and get it also, I guess. So I guess I'm, I want to defer to Brianne and see 
um, kind of where she's at in terms of, you know, discussing the ILA and if she's okay with going to, to Mike on her own or if she would prefer the attorneys be there with her. Brianne? I'm comfortable either way. I'm comfortable talking to Mike Wika. If Deanna's going to be there, then obviously we'd want our legal counsel there as well. Mr. Rowland. Right. Uh, and by, by the way, if I can, Madam Chair, if, if, if it'd be the wish of the board for Brianna to, to, for Brianna to attend a meeting face to face with, without the benefit of counsel, that's certainly your prerogative. Um, but I would urge you that if counsel for the city is present, that she also be girded with lawyers as well. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Mr. Rollins, I'm sorry. You never know where a conversation is going to take you when you have a meeting uh, like this. And uh, I'm, I'm not in favor of amending uh, uh, Aaron's motion. Uh, I, I think it's important that uh, we have one of the, one of the two nicest lawyers uh, accompanying <laughs> uh, Brianne uh, with her to this meeting. I, of of all, all people whose persona I've been with, I'm, I never felt threatened by either Sam or Jake. And I don't feel <laughs> that at least or, or Brianna or Deanna will either. Uh, and I, and I think it's a matter of being able to give uh, uh, Jake or Sam firsthand uh, knowledge of the discussion without having uh, Brian to come back and, uh, and, and to tell them that better that they see it firsthand, I think. So um, I agree with uh, you, Mr. Rollins. I think it's hard enough, it will be hard enough to get everybody on the same pay, you know, in the same meeting and to try to do two or three meetings. This could stretch on for a very long time. It's been very difficult with COVID, and um, I know Brianne could handle herself. She does very well. But as far as the point that Mrs. Wright brought up, as far as the deed restrictions, let's try to get this all ironed out and see, you know, where we stand and how we can proceed. So, is there any more discussion before we before I call the question? Uh, one thing also, I, um, in, I just saw in the chat, I do think we should definitely, definitely have Brianne request um, a joint meeting with them via, if it's Zoom, that's fine. If it's in person in November, <laughs> if we have to, then that's fine too. But um, definitely based on the, you know, circumstances of everything that's happened, I think a joint meeting would be um, something that we definitely need to set up as soon as possible. I agree. Brianne? Just, just to clarify, I have asked for that because that was a, a prior direction of this board. We've been seeking a, um, a joint meeting with the city council, even though we're in the middle of uh, virtual meetings. I never got a response back, so I will follow up on that and, and try to get one set up again. Mr. Rollins. Uh, best that you have an agenda item specifically uh, when you make this request. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, and, the, and it may be nothing more than the fact that you've got the details worked out and we're going to have a kumbaya meeting to talk about it. Uh, but I, I think those details need to be fleshed out so we don't get into, um, so, so we have a more collegial meeting, let's put it that way. Good point. Yeah. Okay. I, I agree with that. Just, just for clarification of the motion. So the way I heard the motion is um, the Greater Boca Raton Beach and Park Director and Council uh, will um, arrange to meet with the City um, Executive and Council to discuss a, an amendment to the interlocal agreement. And in addition, they will discuss any restrictions related to the um, to the Boca Tica property. And hopefully, out of all that we will have a, a joint meeting where we can all approve that interlocal amendment if that's needed. Uh, Joanne, would you clarify and make sure we, we've all got this on the same page and read back the motion? Sure, I have that um, the executive director and district council will meet with city staff and city attorney to discuss the deed restrictions related to the Boca Tica property and the amendment, a possible or any amendment to the ILA and request a joint meeting. Thank you. And it, this has been seconded by Commissioner Rollins. If there's no more discussion, I'm going to call the question. Would you do a roll call vote, please? Can I clarify just slightly? I think it's just the reverse that it should be the, we need an amendment for the interlocal agreement and discuss the possible deed restrictions. Okay. 
I mean, it is, we do need to clarify that interlocal agreement. That, that's the prior, highest priority. And that was part of the motion, yes. Yep. Yes. Yep. Yeah, that, that's a priority, by the way. Yes, absolutely. Okay, Joanne, please do a roll call vote. Okay, Commissioner Ernst? Yes. Commissioner Engel? Yes. Commissioner Rollins? Yes. Commissioner Vogelsang? Yes. And Commissioner Wright? Yes. Motion passes, thank you. Thank you all. Is there any further discussion about the golf course that you'd like to bring up commissioners or uh, general council or our, our council? Nothing further, Madam Chair, thank you. Okay, uh, let's move on to item number two of regular business, the employee evaluation process, Brianne. Commissioners on page 49 of your uh, packets, I made some um, revisions to the job descriptions as well as the evaluation. I kind of detailed what I thought were your um, suggestions for the evaluation process. If everybody was good with what was included in that memo, I can come back at the next meeting with a formal um, uh, process that we can adopt at that point. One, one change that the chair has asked me to make to Joanne's uh, job description, the executive assistant is to add in maintaining an annual calendar of um, priorities. So I'll add that to her job description for the next meeting. If there's any other changes, I can incorporate those. And um, if not, we'll just come back with all this as I just said it and um, finalize it at the next meeting. Commissioners? Yes, Mr. Rollins. Um, I had a few, few comments and uh, if I overlooked these or did not state them prior uh, discussion, I apologize. Um, I, I'm uncomfortable not that I don't uh, value uh, Brianne's opinion of uh, just agreeing uh, to allow a review to by the executive director to uh, give an employee a five percent uh, increase. I'd, I'd like to know. I don't, I don't know how to handle this because of the confidentiality of of these things or, or how other government agencies handle this. And I don't want to micromanage this, but I, I just want to bring up uh, the question: Is everybody comfortable, you know, with uh, the executive director uh, allowing uh, or given the authority to give up to a five percent pay raise? Brianne may not always be our executive director, and I, I, I submit that as uh, just as a, uh, a check on that person's authority by limiting what they can do in that regard. I had I had written it so that everybody all of the board would have individual input before I before it was given to the employee. Okay. Um, if I might uh, go ahead with a few other comments on on the just general comments, I, I think there should be some uh, specificity on some of these uh, things where it when it says that the, in this position is executive assistant the the position will work closely with the Palm Beach County appraiser, uh, you know, in what regard uh, is that, is that going to, how, how are you going to measure that? I guess that's what I'm trying to get to is some of these things are just um, uh, in some respects, and I don't want to use the, the word fluff to degrade the effort that, that was put into this, but unless you've got specific uh, benchmarks of things that, uh, and maybe this is not the place for that, but I would think that you would need specific <coughs> marks, for instance, um, under um, words, work skills, abilities, and knowledge, it just says required certificate, said uh, employee participates in training programs, maintain skills, knowledge, and required certifications and licensing. I, I, I think that that may be okay for this spot right here to have that, uh, but I think you need to have the person that's doing the evaluation and the person that's being evaluated needs to know uh, how to get these certifications and how to get this training that's necessary so it doesn't come up short in an evaluation and you get a, you know, a uh, less, you get meets expectations rather than something more. Is that you understand what I'm saying, Brianne? Yeah, yeah, there's specific reports that are done each year, like with the property appraiser, there's specific things that are filed, the tax collector. So we can attach the calendar of all those things to this. Um, no, I, I guess what I'm just saying is I, I just want to, you doing the evaluation that there be benchmarks that these people, 
besides just the uh, uh, the written cr written criteria, I think there should be benchmarks that uh, where they they know where they can go to get this training, where they know that when they can uh, do the task that uh, says participates in training programs. Uh, okay, what training programs are they going to participate in? Well, those would be something that would be in the goals each year, like okay. at, uh, that okay. you would list at the end of the evaluation. And, and then I think it would be uh, beneficial to the commissioners and and lobbying for their increase that we know what those goals were and that they have met uh, or exceeded those goals. Right. Okay. That would be the goals and the and the and the comments on each of those goals would be part of the evaluation. Okay. All right. Um, thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Rollins. When uh, when does um, your goal setting take place? Well, it would it would take place during the after the first year. It takes place every year annually during the evaluation. You go through the previous year's goals and talk about the next year's goals, and it's sort of a process. I would see working with the employee on what do they what do they see see as a skill that they need to develop over the course of time, and what does the what, what do any, does anybody else see as something that needs to be worked on over the course? Are there any um, CEU um, requirements for any of these positions that we employ? My position does, but no, none of the other positions require anything. Okay. But I, but like this year, we've we've given you know Joanne has sought uh, Excel training. Melissa has been getting training on some um, inspections on properties. So there's things out there that we can do to continue to grow and develop. Okay, Mr. Rollins. Um, Brian. Uh I don't think we have an education budget, do we? We do not, not for our staff. We do pay for city uh, uh, district I, staff. That was my point. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, in, in the future we need to consider, um, or maybe once you do an evaluation, we may need to set up an education budget to allow for the training that these individuals need to achieve to meet expectations or exceed expectations. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, not um, wanting to go overboard, but I think there's going to be some cost to some of these that they'll have to do. And I, I think that we should be expected to compensate the, the employee for that. Agreed. Okay. I agree with you, Mr. Rollins. I, I mean, in my field, um, my boss would pay for it, part of it and I would pay for part of it because it was part of renewing my license. So it was beneficial to me to want to do that. So with this, um, especially with virtual opportunities now, we wouldn't have all the travel expenses and um, that would be a huge benefit to our, our budget. Um, commissioners, do you have anything else to ask Brianne to add to this? Did you have your hand up, Steve? Uh, I was gonna ask a question and then I answered it in my own head. The only thing I'd like to add is I think we can, I, I think, uh, Commissioner Rollins' idea of having an education budget is a good one. Uh, I think it's something, though, that we need to look at every year because uh, needs and requirements are going to change every year. Yeah. Um, and I don't know that we can have any specif specificity toward uh, exactly what kind of education, what kind of courses uh, will be taken because that changes over time. Um, I don't think at this point uh, the uh, courses that might have been beneficial 15 years ago would serve the same purpose now. So I think that's something we have to look at on an annual basis. Mr. Rollins. One final comment to Brianne. Uh, perhaps uh, the review period could be done before we set our budget so that uh, in the discussion with the employee, you can uh, select course work that they need and then uh, put that into a particular line item on our budget. Yes, could do that. Brianne, when are you comfortable with coming back to us with your final information? Well, depending on how the talks about Boca Chica go, I could come back at the next meeting, hopefully with this revised and, and done. I had one question. Mr. Yeah. Rollins, again, just off the... Commissioner Wright? Um, just on page 49, it just talks about um, uh, having employees who are not meeting expectations yeah. and the consequences. So that obviously is on the executive director to handle that, right? Yeah, there's a, there's a, a portion of that in the um, employee handbook. It's not really spelled out. So my recommendation was that 
you know, for the future of the district, for the future employees, we all won't be the same employees forever um, to somewhat define that for at, at some point. Because it, it came so up- So it's not defined. It's not defined what the process will be. It's, it's stated kind of um, openly that these are the options for um, correcting behaviors or, or performances that aren't meeting expectations. Okay, well, can we define it here as it being um, something that the executive director yeah, we can, we deals can with, I yeah. guess? Yes, we can do that. If everybody's in agreement with it. You want a timeline, Commissioner Wright, or? It, um, no, or not what? a timeline, just, you know, uh, you know, in terms of like um, the first issue that arises in terms of an employee not meeting expectations, the executive director deals with or something like that. And then um, if there's further, con further issues that arise in terms of that employee, then it's taken to the board in terms of, um, you know, something like that and just defining who's dealing with the situations. We'll write up, I'll write up a policy and bring <clears throat> the meeting. I mean, because I think also we have to look at the fact that we have sunshine and I think employees, you know, when there's like a, a minor issue in terms of something that comes up, I think it's okay if the executive director deals with it, not in a meeting in front of the public in terms of like our employees, you know what I mean? Um, I mean, if it's a major issue that needs to be discussed with the board, obviously, but minor issues that the executive director needs to deal with, I think can be done um, at work, okay. my opinion. That's uh, Commissioner Ernst, do you get your hand up? Yep, yeah, a couple of quick thoughts is um, I'm fine with it. Um, to uh, Commissioner Wright's point, um, I think she can be guided by um, Jake and Sam because then you get into um, human resources employment law. And I'm just very conscious of this board being dragged into um, individual employee concerns, whatever it is. So the executive director, from my perspective, should be responsible for the employee and that communication, but Jake and Sam can guide us, whatever that language is. Mm -hmm. um, yes, we should be informed as relevant things. The other thing is, is the second thing I want to point out is the 5% rule. I assume it's, it says up to. So the scoring methodology, I think we removed those as percent increases and just refer to them as zero. So it, it, that that's just a scoring methodology. Yeah, I, I've, I removed those and I actually wrote up to 5% every two years. So it would, you know, maybe because we talked about maybe one year, there's no, maybe there's not a, a raise that year, there's other benefits, things like that to consider. So I actually wrote in here that the policy would be up to 5% every two years. So as long I as moved in the budget. So I guess I'd further define that 5% as 5% of their, you know, prior year gross salary or something because you don't want it to be on benefits or whatever it is, just define it. That's, that's my point is define that. Mr. Rollins or Commissioner yes. Rollins has something there. That's great. Uh, Sam, are <clears throat> these uh, valuations uh, uh, subject to public record request? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, and then the last thing was is to address Mr. Rollins' concern um, about the, the property tax appraiser and things like that. Um, I think the focus there is on the accuracy of the reporting and the and the, the revenue and those kind of things. So somewhere, maybe it's in here and I think it needs to be general enough, but it, it's, it ultimately comes back to you, Brianne. You are the accountable person for the accuracy of what we have and working through your staff to make sure everything is you know, correct. So I think what you have here is general enough, it works, but you may wanna make sure you, the accuracy and quality is the most important thing. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you. We've been very fortunate to have two executive assistants who are highly qualified. And between Maddie and Joanne, we've been very fortunate, but we're, we want to look down the road because hopefully the board will be here for another 40, 50 years. Uh, and Joanne may want to retire at some point. So, <laughs> so if, if you would come back to us with your um, ideas and revisions, Brianne, on the first uh, meeting in November, that would be helpful. If you feel that that is rushing you, let us know, please. Okay. Okay. 
All righty. Um, approval of payroll and invoices, Mr. Ernst, do I hear a motion? Yes, Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion for approval of um, payroll and uh, vendor payments of $43,943.13. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Engel. Is there any discussion, commissioners? Hearing none, Joanne, would you please do a roll call vote? You're muted. Oh, I'm sorry. Commissioner Ernst? Yes. Commissioner Engel? Yes. Commissioner Rollins? Yes. Commissioner Vogelson? Yes. And Commissioner Wright? Yes. Motion passes, thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Um, it's time for our reports and discussion items from Executive Director Harms. Would you start us off, please? Sure. Um, next week on October 27th, we are still scheduled for the uh, public hearing for the CRA. I have, I have asked for some clarification on some numbers several times from the city. I have not got those um, numbers to explain the difference between the audited financial statements in April where we, we where it appeared that there would be a sufficient amount of reserves for, uh, for, the, for there not to be a need for our increment payment. Um, that contradicted the budget then that came out in September. So I've asked through some emails, um, have not gotten those actual numbers back, but uh, Jacob and I are still prepared to go to that public hearing. I haven't gotten an official invite or an agenda or anything like that, but we'll be for it and we'll be ready to ask, I guess, then for those numbers and some clarification on that. Um, Regardless of that, I still think that, you know, the fact is that that money could be better spent on recreation now, which is what I stated in my letter um, that I sent last time. Ocean Strand uh, progress is, is finally moving forward. We had some hiccups with permitting and, and getting some things approved through rec services, but we got it done. The permit is, is out there, so they'll start the process of removing those two and a half acres of invasives over the next couple of weeks. And after that, they're submitting the um, plans for the approval of the of the asphalt walkways and the and the ramping next so we'll start going through that moving forward is a, is a good thing um and then the the last thing i had um oh we had two bids come in for the patch reef pickleball courts so staff is reviewing those calling some references we'll have those packets out to you this week so you'll have plenty of time to review them and ask questions before our next meeting and then um I think everybody may remember in April of 2019, we went out for an RFP to do shade structures at Sugar Sand and at De Hornley Park. And then the city came back and said, since they owned De Hornley Park, they would manage the shade project there. And they planned on doing it last fiscal year. Um, it did not ever get done. And um, we thought it would start, you know, sometime in the early of the part of the fiscal year, they had about six months before the pandemic happened, but it, it just didn't happen. So they want to do it this year. And um, it unfortunately was not included in the budget for the 100,000. So the city is asking for that 100,000 again um, to do the shade structures at De Hornley Park. We, we certainly can, can accommodate that with our reserve funds. Um, I didn't want to sign off on that without letting you all know that that had happened and see where what you all what the direction was. We could also just ask them to come up with that out of their own budget if they still wanted to put those shade structures up there. Commissioners, any thoughts? <clears throat> Mr. Rollins, uh, <clears throat> what part of their budget are you thinking they would want to come come out of the money with, uh, Brian? Well, I don't know where they would come out of it in their side of the budget. I, I think that they could make some adjustments or I, I don't know that all their CIP will get done this year that they think they'll get done. Um, we would have to take it out of our reserves. Do, do we not have a reserve set up for them? We set up just for specific projects. We could take it out of that and, and then not approve those other projects, those other vehicles. May I Yes, Mr. Ernst. May I suggest let's let's see where they come with it for the residents' sake. We need those shade structures. So um, I think the city said they are prioritizing it, and when they're ready to present us with something, we will take it under consideration. But I can tell you, residents need those shade structures. They're they're ready. They've asked for it to be signed yeah. up. Yeah. See, I'm <laughs> Mr. Rollins is making fun of my no hair here. <laughs> I absolutely want that shade structure. Can I ask uh, Melissa a question? Um, is this a, because you've bid this kind of a project out before, right. is this a fair number for this? I, th I think it went in line with what we anticipated, correct? Yeah. 
it was in line with what we anticipated. That was, you know, April of 2019 that we had gone out for that. Okay. We had it done in, in August. We could have had these done too in August of 2019. It just, unfortunately, the city decided to manage it themselves. Commissioner Wright, you had your hand up? No. Oh, okay, sorry. Mr. Rollins. I, I, I support, uh, you know, finding a way to get this done. As uh, Craig said, I mean, it's, I go to other parks and, you know, <clears throat> and there's uh, shade structures there. And believe me, by the, by the time, uh, you know, the sports seasons are over, you're going to be wishing you had had them. And, uh, and so 100,000, now that we're, you know, probably in the midst of a postponement of a, a major project um, or the dissolution of a major project, we probably have 100,000 that we can spare. And I, I would certainly welcome the opportunity to vote yes for that. Okay. Is that a motion, Mr. Rollins? Of course. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll make a motion that we, uh, you know, uh, uh, either amend the budget or allow for the funding uh, to the city for the hundred thousand dollars in shade structures. I second. Thank you, Mr. Ernst. Is there any further discussion? Okay, Joanne, would you do a roll call vote on this? Uh, Commissioner Ernst. Yes. Commissioner Engel. Yes. Commissioner Rollins. Yes. Commissioner Vogelsang. Yes. And Commissioner Wright. Yes. Motion passes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Brianne, do you have anything else? I do not, thank you. Okay, it's time for district council. Mr. Gorin uh, or Mr. Horowitz. Madam Chair and Commissioners, thank you for the time. Thank you for listening to uh, our earlier presentation regarding the status of the relationship with the city. I hope, I hope it was clarifying and helpful in the context of the overall status we're in at the moment. Um, one, one quick update, if I may, we received back some additional title information on the Ocean Strand property. Uh, I should be issuing uh, from our office, Jacob and I both, a title opinion to the district, which indicates that the three excluded parcels that were not part of the sketch and description that Steve Watts prepared, uh, affixed to, to the recorded declaration of restrictions, uh, are owned by the district. Um, and we are able to then opine based upon our uh, title evidence and information from the, the attorney's title insurance fund, um, that the district owns all the property and we'll, we'll so opine in a memorandum and provide the backup to you as well for the public records of the district, which is good to, good, good information. We also had that review by, by, by um, Mr. Watts who confirmed the legal descriptions from the three other parcels that were excluded and they're now gonna be included and we'll do a, a revision to that, that, uh, that document going forward. So um, good news to, to pass on to you on a, on a Monday night, rainy Monday night, so thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Commissioners, Mr. Ernst. Um, Medicare, thank you. Just real brief. Um, I wanted to uh, visit, revisit the um, foundation. And let me explain my thought logic on it very briefly is that over the um, past month, I accepted a challenge for uh, men to wear pink in honor of breast cancer. And so it may look like a white shirt is really a pink shirt. And I've been wearing some level of pink or pink shirts every day for the month of October. And two things came out of that. One is I chose to go to visit a park every day during this month, including today it was raining. Um, and I visit a park and I take a picture in front of the sign. I look at the park as best I can in the time I have there. Um, but what it occurred to me is going to some of the pocket parks, some of the pocket, the parks that you, we just rarely go to, um, they are, we are truly a great city with some great mini parks. And some of these parks are very small. They're not all like uh, the Hornley Park or Sugar Sand, but they are great parks. And the city does a phenomenal job of maintaining them and they're very new and everything. And the reason I think that the foundation is a good idea is because down the road, as you said, um, 50 years down the road, the one of the things for this district is that if the city was to become as large as the district, um, this district by its bylaws goes away. Um, I do think that um, we should, um, someday it may happen, I don't know, but the foundation would be a continuing factor for it. And I think that the foundation, we can do it on a very small scale without a lot of cost. And if the, the district is concerned about the, um, the operational running it, I'd be happy to do it on my, my own with support of just time from maybe you or from Mr. Rollins 
as board members on it, but I think setting up that foundation creates an avenue to collect money from whether it's people who've lived in this community who want to donate for the sole purpose of preserving green space and preserving our parks and making it as something into the future. And one thing I know is someone who's you know, managing investments, um, the opportunity is very, it's there. You can really make more with a small number even into something much larger through a separate investment structure that is, you know, can be put out there for many years down the road. So my point to the, the group is, is that I'd really like us to revisit that foundation at a, a future agenda and make it a priority um, and say that we're gonna do that um, and do it at a very low cost role. And if the, and I don't think it takes very much, but if, the, if, if there's a, still hesitancy, then I'd ask that you take that foundation and let me do it. I'll do it myself. I believe in it strongly enough and I'd have Mr. Engel on it. Um, I think it's important and that we can do this thing and it will benefit the community in the long run. And that's my only comments. And I also, one last thing, I wanna thank Mr. Rollins. Um, Mr. Rollins did control, Commissioner Rollins donated to this event for, and I greatly appreciate everything I have learned from you and this group. Um, and um, just what I personally thank Mr. Rollins for his support. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ernst, and thank you for supporting breast cancer. I've learned a lot. Thank you. Mr. Engel, I know we discussed at um, one point that you were going to have some discussion about the foundation with outside sources. So why don't you do your commissioner's report, if you would, please? Sure. Um, uh, I have to be honest, I'm not prepared to give something formal, but I can tell you that we've had, uh, with the help of uh, uh, our, our attorneys, we have had discussions with uh, other uh, taxing districts and municipal organizations with regard to how they run their uh, foundations. And it's very enlightening and, in my opinion, very doable. Now that Commissioner Ernst has volunteered to take on the entire burden, that, uh, that makes it that much easier. But uh, my initial sense is this is something that's eminently doable uh, by the Beach and Park District, establishing a Beach and Park Foundation. There are a, a lot of different things that we can do. Um, and, and, you know, I should also ask, uh, mention that Brienne uh, has played a part. Um, and we, uh, Brienne and I have discussed things that can be done in the interim before we even have uh, a, a formal foundation. Um, but this is something that is very doable by the district and uh, it is something that I think would be to our benefit and to the community's benefit as well. But I will have more for you, hopefully, if not next meeting, then the meeting following. Is there anything else you'd like to report? That's it. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Wright? Yeah, I just wanted to bring up um, this weekend, I don't know if it's a one-time thing, um, Mr. Rollins might know more too. Um, I was at FAU at the soccer fields off of Blades because my kid, or actually Craig, you might know too. Um, and uh, the bathrooms were like unusable. I don't know if we can, <laughs> um, and there's a lot of teams coming from Miami and Wellington and visiting these fields or our home fields. Um, they were really gross. Um, so I don't know if we can say, if we can, if Brianne can, um, you know, relay this to uh, FAU to, to see if there can be some um, cleaning like before these Saturday games and Sunday games uh, in the morning and then maybe midday or something um, because uh, just, it was embarrassing to have teams come and not be able to use the bathrooms because they were unusable. Brianne, would you look into that for Commissioner? Mm -hmm please, and for all these soccer players? Yes. Anything else, Mrs. Wright? Nope, that was it. Commissioner Rollins. Yep. First of all, I've been wearing this pink shirt all day wanting Mr. Ernst to say something about it tonight, and he hasn't said a word. So, Craig, it is pink. Yeah, I hope you can see that. And I do have my I voted 
uh, sticker on my shirt today too. So everybody do your civic duty. Um, uh, just two things. One about the restrooms, Aaron, that's been just an ongoing problem over there. Do they still have the portalets outside? No, it's just okay. the building that they okay. have. So. Yeah. Uh, Brianna, I, I th think I can give you uh, Brian Wright's email address and you can send him an email. Uh, he's very responsive. The other thing that uh, there has been a complaint about over there was the, uh, the netting on the west side of the, uh, the fields there it was in disrepair and balls were going deep into the, to yeah. the jungle. Um, and um, there was a concern about player safety and uh, Brian supposedly working on that uh, along with the maintenance person. Uh, finally, uh, I, don't want, I don't want anything I said to be misinterpreted about the, the golf course. I, I think that it was a, a, a wonderful addition to the city's recreational amenities. I just wish there could have been a different way that it was handled. Um, and the, the transparency bothered me. Uh, since we make a point to be transparent in everything that we do, I, I, was, I, I was disappointed in that albeit I understand the sensitivity of that project. I just still feel like there could have been some way that, um, you know, our, our concerns could have been incorporated into that decision. And that's it. Thank you. Um, I do have a question for our council. I, I know we got a letter from the governor saying that this is our final virtual meeting. Is that correct? Even in, in light of the fact that the numbers are going up and there's a concern between flu and and Corona, um, are we going to meet in the uh, Willow Theater next meeting? That's the best answer I have, and, and Jake, feel free to, to, to supplement this discussion, but the governor's order, uh, which is entered on September the 30th, 20-246, perhaps, um, I don't have the number in front of me, uh, essentially was covered with a memorandum from the press secretary for the governor, which indicated that local government units are to prepare for live meetings as of November the 1st. Um, okay. So based upon that information, and then that was issued at the, at the late hour in September the 30th, it gave everyone a month to work from. If you give me one second, I'll actually give you the memo. Hold on one second. The, um, I read this back to the Regional Planning Council this morning because it's worth noting. This is not just my thinking. There was a memorandum affixed to the governor's order, which was number 20-246, which says the following. The state of Florida recently entered phase three of the governor's plan for Florida's recovery from COVID-19. Executive order 20-246 assists the transition to phase three by providing local government bodies with an additional one month period to conduct their meetings virtually. Local, governments, lo go go local government bodies should prepare to meet in person as required by Florida law beginning on November 1 of 2020. So the answer is absent an order from the governor that would supplement um, this one, which is 20-246, the answer is, is that you need to have a physical quorum present to do business as of, that, as, as of November 1. Um, how we treat the public's access is, a, is, a, is a, an allied and similar issue, but to the extent that the actual business of the organization needs to be conducted by a physical quorum of at least three, that's the requirements of this uh, governor's order. Thank you, Mr. Gore. Mr. Yes, Ross, you have a, a, a question? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. There was one thing I forgot to, to mention. Uh, I, I received a phone call from a representative of the Boca Hospital, and they're, as you know, they're always building something. And they have two towers planned to uh, build on the property the next five years, and they're looking for parking areas uh, for their employees. Uh, and uh, I, I, I mentioned this to Brianne and told her I'd bring this up. <clears throat> uh, they're looking for 60 parking places um, per month. And in the future years, the numbers are well beyond the scope of anything that we have. In 2022, there, there need between 150 and 600 parking places for ho hospital employees, construction workers, and the like. And it just goes on and on. Uh, and uh, he asked uh, about a Sugar Sand Park. And um, I, I said, you know, I'll mention that to uh, our executive director. I don't know that we have many parking, that many parking spaces that we could allocate uh, for a year, um, not knowing what our demands will be for the other parts of the park. Certainly in the uh, main area, the, the, the field house, the community center, the, the science playground, the, those 
spaces there need to be preserved for uh, the patrons to the park. The other spots are baseball. I don't know how many spots we have there or whether it's worth uh, any re any consideration to uh, help with this uh, problem. Uh, and I just lay that out there. If you want Brian to investigate the spots that we have available, um, I can report back to them. We're still looking at it, but it's up to you guys. Brian. You're muted. I did go and count today. We, we don't have sufficient spaces to, to really um, help them out at, at Sugar Sand, okay. even at the ball fields. If, if it's uh, uh, with the board's permission, I'll relay that to message back to the representative of the hospital. There's nowhere else that we could consider or um, that they would be, that they would consider? Well, you're you're looking looking at uh, you know this is something that's going to go on seven days a week um, and uh, you know all hours of the day and night. Uh, so I don't know whether you would want to be able to keep the you could keep the park open. I I think they're going to satisfy their needs somewhere else with either FAU or the IBM property, um, the old IBM property. Um, and as as I said, I. I I just think that uh, it it could be um, it, it could be an inconvenience to our park users to have th th those space occupied, especially if you have baseball in the spring. They're going to be there in the afternoon, and and these they're looking for a year's commitment uh, on this. Uh, so, if you guys want to uh, kick it around, talk about it next time, I'll be happy to pass that along as well. Chairs, what's your pleasure? Would you like to put it on the next agenda so that uh, we can investigate that further? Just as a comment, I know when we played baseball, um, the weeknights that there was practice and um, on the weekends, we had to park on the grass because there was no parking available. So um, that's just a, you know, there, there's, that would um, make it really hard. <laughs> Mr. Ernst? Yeah, I would add, I support what Aaron says. There, there really is no, I mean, it's peak up and down peak time. And from what you described, Mr. Rollins or Commissioner Rollins, it sounds like they're looking for their construction crew somewhere to come in and bus over to the thing. It'd probably be closer and better for them to work with the airport authority because it's right near 95, it's accessible. Um, and somewhere or FAU would be better. Um, that would, so I, my recommendation is not to entertain it any further. But I do want to add on one thing I forgot to mention since you brought up the baseball fields. Um, in my elected official role, I was approached by a um, Boy Scout and he had one question that he was required as, to get a badge. And his badge question was, what one thing would you do, um, ask your city to do to improve something? And so his question to me, and I was, I was, was, he wanted to know why the baseball fields at Sugar Sand, he can't walk on the, the fields with his dad and just play ball when no one's on the fields. And so I've heard that question before at, at Woodland. Um, and I think maybe we're being a little bit too tight on that stuff, but I asked to, uh, I'll arrange a meeting with um, someone from the city to follow up on it. And I was waiting for an email to kind of, finalize that I never got that, but I still want to follow up on that fact because it's the second time in four years I've heard that question. Um, so. Okay, well, we have uh, Mr. Rollins subject of the parking space Agreed. put to bed first and then we'll come back to your. Um, Thank you. Okay, so do we have a consensus that, um, or do you, uh, would you prefer to have a, a Brianne look into this further? If there's a consensus that we should not offer any parking spaces and commit to that for a year. Just, uh, I'd like to have a, a actually a motion. Uh, as Madam Chairman, I think that it's not that we don't want to offer, we just don't have the spaces to offer to them. And that, I, you put and, that better than I did. So Thank if you. you're liking the motion, I would just, uh, I would like to uh, make the motion that uh, uh, unfortunately we don't have the space to accommodate their request uh, or parking at the uh, park. A second. Second. Thank you, Mr. Engel. Any more discussion? Joanne, would you do a roll call vote, please? 
Sure. Commissioner Ernst? Yes. Commissioner Engel? Yes. Commissioner Rollins? Yes. Commissioner Vogelsang? Yes. And Commissioner Wright? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Ernst, let's address the uh, baseball fields. Brianne, would you like to weigh in on that for him? I can talk to the city about it. I know that there's signs up. There's It's happened on the rectangle fields too. Um, so I will ask Michael for some clarification on the policies there. I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll follow up with you separately, Brianne, and, and okay. maybe get the the, um, the student and, and to have a conversation with the city too. Okay. And uh, Chairman, yes, uh, Mr. I, I support what Craig's uh, asking the city about because that's been a, a, a question mark for years about uh, the rectangular fields, you know, it's like dads and their kids should go out there or their moms and their kids should go out there. If they're not in use, they, I see no harm in them uh, pitching ball and or taking batting practice between the two of them. Just as a comment too, it's the soccer fields because I've had a couple of people ask, like they can't go out there with their kid and have a kick around, like okay. when the fields aren't in use. I get it if it's a big group of people who are playing like a scrimmage or something like that. But if you know it's a kid and they're, you know, even mom, four people, dad, yeah. yeah, you know, we, we need to we need to address that policy because it's wrong that they mm -hmm. deny kids kids and their uh, family from little pickups games and uh, that's that's what reason I got involved in recreation so people could recreate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, I sorry. One more thing I forgot to say. Um, somebody had made a comment to me the other night at Spanish River Athletic Combat Complex that uh, I don't I don't have names or anything like that, but that um, it was in the evening that some of the people that are working there are on their phones constantly instead of monitoring the fields and things like that. Um, so it's just something that I don't know if it's, you know, um, an issue constantly or if it was just this one person but I have noticed it myself that some of the people who are working there are on their phones instead of is it are these rangers commissioner right um it's actually I think it's the athletic staff okay. that are working in the evening time um Green. that are you know I'll follow up with the recreation services yeah okay thank you um, other than our joint meeting and the foundation and the, the use of the, the fields, are there any future agenda items? Brianne? Pickleball. Um, oh. We'll award that contract. Okay. Anything else, commissioners? Okay. Right. One on the pickleball. Sorry to delay you, but um, our. Um, Fellow resident CPA at um, Boca Tica sent everyone a video uh, related to the U.S. Pickleball Association and what they did in Naples. And I, I did watch the whole thing. It's incredible. So it, the point is, it's another option. That there are many things we can do at Boca Tica. And I think um, that's an opportunity for the community to have a lot of input that we decide what, what's going to happen. But we will do good things and great things out of Boca Tica. Well, I agree. The community needs to be involved. Um, Mr. Engel? I move to adjourn. Second. Okay, thank you, Mr. Rollins. Joanne, a roll call vote, please. Commissioner Ernst? Yes. Commissioner Engel? Yes. Commissioner Rollins? Yes. Commissioner Vogelsang? Yes. And Commissioner Wright? Yes. All right. The meeting is adjourned. Everybody stay safe. We'll Good see night, you everybody. Everybody. Good night. Happy